Welcome to the Nonprofit Report, your update on nonprofit organizations and issues and leaders. I'm your host, Mark Oppenheim. Today, we're discussing making higher education more accessible by breaking down key barriers with special guests. Steve Colon, CEO of Bottom Line in Boston, Massachusetts, and Carla Salazar, Executive Director of Scholar Match Incorporated in San Francisco, and Steve Stein, CEO of Thrive Scholars, also in Boston, Massachusetts. So thank you all for joining us. We're going to go, Steve, to the bottom line, uh, but I'll, uh, let me set you up just by saying the college attendance and graduation can be a route to prosperity that is closed to those with limited financial resources, mentors, and other kinds of support. So the questions that we face are, how do we introduce students that are facing the financial and other challenges to the possibility of higher education? How do we help them through the application process? And how do we help them through the experience of going through graduation, finding a job and getting launched? You know, it's, it's, it's really a matter of import for the United States because there are so many people who are at the lower end of the spectrum, but have infinite capabilities. We want to make sure that they are engaged in American civil society and makes us stronger. So, Steve, what is your bottom line on this on this uh, uh, question, and how do you approach uh, uh, dealing with some of these issues? Yeah, we we uh, we try to tackle it head on. So, uh, thank you very much for having me. Super excited uh, to be here. Uh, bottom line is a nonprofit that for twenty five years has been helping partner with degree aspiring students to get into college, graduate, and go far in life. Um, and we really focus our efforts on relationship based advising, and I think that's really the first critical key. Study after study shows that students want to get a bachelor's degree, they want to go to college, but they're fearful of the cost and the implications that come with attending um, a higher ed institution. And so for us, we know that first and foremost, we need to bring experts, consistent, caring, knowledgeable experts to partner with those students to help them get as much information as possible to make an informed choice. College is a very expensive investment, but there are obviously great outcomes that come along with the bachelor's degree. And so for us, it's about helping students really start to think about what they want to achieve in their post-secondary career, what they're looking to do, the type of environment where they can be successful culturally, the type of environment they can be successful financially, and then have them really think about the financial implications of choosing a college where they can be successful. So that's really our approach. Our approach is really focused on affordability. Um, We have a very specific goal of having students not only graduate with a bachelor's degree, but graduate with less than $31,000 worth of debt. Because we understand that college is about social and economic mobility. Um, And that really is why we call ourselves the bottom line. The bottom line is about the life outcomes related to college and not college for college's sake. So it's it's really interesting, Carla. When when you look at at Steve's approach, he's talking about a holistic approach. He's starting off with the financial need, but also surrounding uh, members uh, who are going through this. It's it's really more of a community ideal, in which the young person functions as a member of a community going through this, and then a community is built around them that consists not only of their parents and their relatives and their friends, but also others who bring other qualities and knowledge to the table. Are, are you taking the same ap- uh, approach at, at Scholar Match? And what does your version of this service look like? Absolutely. And good morning. Thank you, Mark, for inviting Scholar Match to participate. Most definitely, we were started in 2010 by Deb Eggers as a crowdfunding platform. <clears throat> and early, three years later, we, the organization learned that that wasn't enough, that just to you know, date scholarships and, and provide the scholarships to college students. We created a seven-year comprehensive program model. We start with the junior year in high school with a student providing a one-on-one mentor that helps the student apply through college, FAFSA, the college application, and then they move into the scholarship program, which is where we provide the one-on-one advising support, the targeted financial support up to 30,000 of uh, college support until they graduate. We focus on the career success because I agree with Steve, it's not enough that we get them to graduate. We gotta make sure that there's social mobility and that they have those that robust social network. You can have a PhD, but if you don't have the emotional intelligence, the skills and that network, it's gonna take you longer to ha- build that career pathway. So in, in Scholar Match, really understand 
that it's a seven year program model comprehensive where we're working from junior year until they graduate, making sure that they have those internships, providing support for those the internships, encouraging for the study abroad. Therefore, a lot of low income families, that's not a concept that it's foreign to them to even think that my child could go and study abroad in Latin America or Europe. We provide funding for that. And during the pandemic, that was such a critical that we had that flexibility funding, those micro grants of $500 that helps students from getting a hotspot to paying rent. And that's pivotal. A lot of universities are picking up on that and creating similar models of support. That's what we need. I've heard horror stories where students are telling me I can't graduate because I owe five hundred dollars in parking tickets or library fines or so forth. That, that to me, is just inconceivable that in a nation as rich as we are, that students can't graduate because they owe five hundred dollars. You know, one of the things that that is interesting as as we survey this market, for example, we were doing some work with the uh, Hispanic Scholarship Fund and we were recruiting the head of their programs. And then there was a big, big, big board controversy in which uh, there was there was politics, board politics and all this other stuff. And they decided to get rid of all programs and just go to the scholarship side which was interesting. And that's part of this debate. So you all represent a a firm camp of being very holistic in your approach. Steve, could you describe your part of this puzzle? And then we're going to go back to this question of it's easier to raise money for scholarships than it is to raise money for all these other support and, and to provide all this other support. Let's talk about why it's important that this is not just a money problem, but there are other aspects uh, to this. So we're going to come back to that. Steve, could you describe your part of this puzzle? Because I thought I thought it was very interesting. Yeah, no, I'm happy to do so. And, and you know, like Steve and Carla, we're a, you know, I, I think the organizations that are good at this work have learned that you need to have that holistic wraparound multi-year support. Like, like, like both uh, bottom line and seller match, we start with students in high school. We pr- provide relationship-based advising around where to go to college and going through the financial aid process, college application process, social emotional support in college, mentorship in college, career-based support in college. You know, but we actually ironically started as a scholarship organization 20 years ago, providing scholarships to students going off to college. And what we found was a lot of our scholars were not navigating college successfully. Maybe they were going, but they weren't graduating. If they were graduating, they didn't have the grades that they wanted and they couldn't stay in the majors that they wanted. So you know, I would ask anybody that kind of goes into this work is what, what are the goals that you're trying to accomplish? And are you accomplishing those goals with the program that you have? So you know, if you're just a scholarship-based organization and don't do the other support that I think we realize is really important, are your students graduating in college? Are they graduating with good grades? Are they graduating with low debt? What are the jobs that they're having out of college? I think those are the most important questions that we want to be asking ourselves. And for us, you know, one of the things that I'll, you know, we, I agree with everything that Steve and Carla said, but another thing that we found was, you know, we're, again, we've been around for about 20 years and 10 years ago, our students were going off. Uh, and, and one of the things that's a little bit unique about, about us is we work with very high achieving students, same low income students of color, but our students go to IVs and top 50 colleges. And one of the things that we were finding was, you know, 10 years ago, we were providing the kinds of support that was mentioned here, but our scholars and our scholars were graduating college over 90% were graduating college. However, 80% of the students interested in STEM were not, when they went to college, were not graduating with a STEM degree. Uh, these students who had A's and B's in, in high school were graduating with a GPA below a 3.0. And it's because they were going to under-resourced high schools compared to the peers that they had and then where their peers were going to and where their peers were going to high school. And so they weren't as academically ready. You know, 50% of the black students in this country go to a high school that doesn't offer calculus. Right. So when you go to a college where everyone else is taking calculus, you know, how can you expect to be prepared? So one of the things that we've started doing uh, that I haven't heard mentioned here yet is an intensive academic prep. So for us, we have a summer academy that our students go to for six weeks before 12th grade, and then again, six weeks before they get to college. And it's three hours a day of calculus and three hours a day of college writing on a college campus taught by college professors. And what we found was once we started offering that summer academy, the grades of our students went from under a 3.0 to a 3-4, the STEM persistence from 20% to 65%, the graduation rate from 90% to 98%. And the, and the reason that's really important is 
the average GPA of the schools that our students go to is a 3-3. Our students are a 3-4. The average STEM persistence that the schools our students go to is a 56%. Our students are at 65. The average graduation rate is low 90s. Our students are at 98. What that shows is if you give students like ours and bottom line students and scholar match students the same opportunities as their peers are getting from better resource neighborhoods, they outperform them, right? The talent is there, the motivation is there. They just don't have the, the same opportunities. And when you provide everything that we're doing, the bottom line is doing, the scholar, I shouldn't speak for them, but I think at least everything that we're doing, we're replicating opportunities that more privileged students in this country have. That well, I don't wanna, they have. Yeah. And I don't want to suggest that, that there isn't space for just scholarship programs, right? But I think that, that holistically from a student's point of view, you need the scholarship programs and maybe just having organizations who are just focused on scholarship is good, but the wraparound services really do make a difference. So let's talk a little bit about what that consists of, because Carla, one of the things that, that, that you mentioned is if somebody has 500 parking tickets, well, I have to, I have to honestly say that I don't want to necessarily invest through scholar match in the 500 parking ticket person, right? So how do you talk with somebody like me where I want to provide, like if somebody has, has uh, is working really hard or is a single parent or uh, needs some space in their rent, I want to help. But do I want to invest in somebody who gets 500 parking tickets? Not so much, to be, to be perfectly honest. Um, so how do you talk with somebody like me and help me to understand the true value that you bring? Absolutely. You know, there's different entryways into supporting our program. As I mentioned, there's a destination college program, which is our high school program. And that's where we support students through the you know, college application process. The other is a scholars program. And that's where we focus on the college from freshman and to graduation senior year. And so there's different campaigns that we do so for emergency funding, for career development, and what we're now calling college shower. So to help the student transition into college is uh, for the scholarship. Of, part of your, excuse me for interrupting. Is a part of what you're doing, you know, I'm, I'm also thinking of myself as somebody who might be ignorant, right? Who might be goodwill, mm -hmm. but might not, but might be ignorant of the life of, of someone else who is facing some difficulties. And so part of this is you're, you're trying to change me and change my behavior, change my knowledge base. Um, how do you deal with, do, do you basically try to structure your programs to uh, not only help, but also to create some sort of a connection so that we're all understanding this issue and solving it together? I mean, yes, you know, a lot of what what uh, along in the mission in terms of, you know, focusing on first generation low income and the lack of resources where the students that we're serving are coming, serving those, as Steve mentioned earlier, the high school students that we work with and serve are those who whose communities are under resourced. They don't provide the calculus. They don't provide the the. the college prep courses that are needed and necessary. So we too have partnered with organizations like UC Scouts that provide courses online uh, for those students who are in, the, in those situations. Also, what, how we see ourselves, we provide an online, we're, we're a virtual platform even before the pandemic. So we're able to partner and, and provide that one-on-one -on -one coaching and support for the students early on and make that connection that's transferred into the college, into the college program. And that's an essential trust, really trusting relationship. You're helping that student navigate through a college system that is foreign to them. They're coming from families whose background, this is where a lot of students, a lot of you know, community identify. We all, those who are first generation, who haven't had, whose family never went to college, this is where they feel that connection because they understand what it is like. It's making that connection and bridging, you know, what do you remember about your college experience and how hard it was where you had to work 30 hours to be able to go to school and never really enjoy your college experience and be able to create those you know, social networks that are essential. So it's making that connection of the importance, not only of graduating, but helping that student understand and get that support system so they can graduate. California is the fifth largest economy. 
we cannot afford to not have a population ready for those you know high paying jobs and high technology jobs that we have. So there's various you know reasons why you want to invest in our students. Sir, a superb points, and it also points to your value add because I wouldn't necessarily know where to invest. But working through you at Scholar Match or through Steve at, at the bottom line or through you, Steve, at, at Thrive Scholars, I gain access to your experience, your knowledge to make sure that my investment has, has impact. Uh, Steve, you were about to say comment on something that Carla was, was talking about? Yeah, I mean, I think it's really important for us to put in context that um, you know, on a pathway to a college, life happens, <laughs> right? And for the students that we work with, simple things like uh, a late fee on a book, um, a $25 parking ticket, um, a, a lost textbook, those things can be the difference between a degree and no degree. And so that shouldn't be the case for any student in America. That should not be the case for the most affluent and privileged students. And it should not be the case for students who come from low income communities. So what, what we do is provide for the students that we work with, we partner with them to navigate things that are just riskier for the populations that we work with and help them circumnavigate those things to provide them with the type of supports that they that are their more privileged peers would have, right? And I think this is the point that Steve was making. So 100% of Steve's on this call agree, right? This idea of what we're trying to do is sort of balance a path towards a degree that for the students who bottom line works with is littered with um, you know, blocks and, 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 and barriers in front of them, sometime purposefully to sort of stop their progress towards a degree. And that's really where I think we're different and why we focus on not just paying for college, but are you making adequate progress towards your, towards your degree academically? Are you getting the career readiness skills you need to graduate as a career ready sort of person? And also life skills, right? Being a, a student of color, being a student who is new to a college campus, a first generation student, that comes with a lot of personal issues, a lot of things that you have to deal with. I, speaking for myself as a first gen student, I felt almost every day as an imposter on that campus trying to navigate what was going on. And so we've got to make sure that we put the student at the center because they are the ones who need to succeed. And we provide wraparound services to ensure that these small or that these uh, barriers that there are in front of them are not going to be the thing that stops them from reaching their ultimate goal, which is a degree. So I think that, that you're both making such such excellent points. You know, if if I look at my own family, we I have in my family people where life happened, right? Where people got derailed, where um, graduations didn't happen for whatever reason, um, executive function skills, um, self-esteem issues, um, uh, uh, learning attributes, right? There are all these different, different things, uh, sometimes debt, sometimes addiction, right? You have these different things happen within the context of a family. Um, you can sort of deal with some of them, but sometimes you need help, right, Steve? Uh, Steve Stein, right? If, if, if I'm coming to you and I've, I've been able to work my way through graduation, talk about that experience. How do I, how do I encounter you? How do you encounter me? And how do you deal with me in a, when I'm in a very vulnerable and sensitive position? Um, how do you uh, help? Yeah, and I also, and I'll answer that, but I also want to you know, go back to the original question you asked about how do we impact you, Mark, I think, right? And I think that a, lar a large part of the work that we're all doing is helping our scholars access spaces that weren't built for them. And a large part of the work that needs to happen is those spaces need to change. And um, you know, for example, there was a, a situation where uh, someone in the corporate world was bemoaning the fact that there weren't enough um, qualified candidates of color to work at their company and said, the problem is in the pipeline. And that person got a lot of flack for, for framing it that way. And I think what's important for us to realize is, and the reason is, it's not just the fact that the students aren't there, it's the, the places need to change, the unconscious bias and the way that the hiring happens and the way that um, people of color are supported in these companies. It also might be a pipeline problem. It's not that like by itself, that was a false, that was a false statement. But when you frame it as just a pipeline problem, you say, well, the problem is in us, the problem is them and it's these students. And so part of the work that we try to do. And problem, it's, problem is never me. It's always somebody else. Right. Isn't it? And so I think part of the work that we try to do, and it's really hard 
especially when we're talking about these really big institutions, is is having conversations with the colleges our students go to and the play and the employers our students go to, uh, and, and helping them at, at the small levels we can make those places more accessible for our scholars. And that requires folks to change the way that they understand the world and, like, and just the way that Steve and Carla were talking about. Isn't part of this that we need to collectively be better at communicating with each other, with, with each other, right? Educating each other on our perspectives, respecting each other's for respect for perspectives that might not be ours, right? Um, respecting the lived experience of somebody who has a different life than we do, whether it's somebody who is uh, white and uh, middle class or, or upper middle class or, you know, whatever their financial in the, uh, is there or black and upper middle class or, or, or lower class or, or somewhere in between, whatever, whatever all this, this class stuff means. We have, to, we have to actually think a little bit differently. How do we get there? I mean, we're not going to have some sort of a spiritual transformation all of a sudden, right? A light switch isn't going to suddenly come on. How do we get from a place where people are yelling at each other and not really supporting and having a, an education function, uh, a system that doesn't function for everyone to one where we actually are engaging the full talents here in this country? You know, I, uh, we, we just did a couple of uh, polls and we'll, we'll talk about that. But Carla, let me throw this to you and then to Steve Colon. And, and um, wh what do you think, Carla? I mean, it starts with dialogue, you know, that's what we've been doing better with that along coupled with action. Uh, we've been talking about race relations and, you know, for centuries, but the needle has moved, but not fast enough to counter what we're seeing. We're seeing a decline in enrollment in higher education, and that's alarming. It should be alarming for all of us. It has serious implications short term and long term for all of us. It seems whether like we're putting energy into, into yelling at each other about, about a couple of books that we might not want our children to read, right? As opposed Absolutely. to the bigger issues, which is too many children don't get to read. Absolutely. It's really looking at the root. Where are the disconnect? Why is it that in the United States, certain, depending on where you live, your education, the quality of your education is different. That's the conversation that we need to have. Why is it that we don't have great child care to start with? Why is it that we're not building a college ready culture, encouraging all of us to have access? My dream is that before I die, the United States provides free higher education to our students. Europe doesn't. Why can't we do that? That would be my dream. Those are the conversations I want to have. Let's focus on our common ground, on what is best for the United States, for its population, for our children. That's the common ground. And I believe that's what would get us all focused on the positive, on the deeply rooted issues that are going to have, have an impact and really focus us on making change. To me, it's about our refocusing our energy on positive, on things that we have a common ground and common issues. You know, it's interesting that you talk about this. Um, we, we've completed three polls. The first poll is on barriers to entry. What is the biggest challenge to college application and entry? Um, we, got, we got votes in three categories. Costs are too high. Uh, and then there's confusion about um, what qualifications are required in order to enter, enter college. So that's costs, confusion, and we also got some information on uh, discrimination. Um, in the in barriers to completion, costs are there again, but confusion also is just it ranks way up there. So you've got costs on the one hand, so you can deal with costs through scholarships, right? Confusion is really requires counseling. So it's it, it does sort of um, uh, uh, endorse um, so many positions that you're taking about the supportive side of this as well as the financial side. And then finally, we asked, are there other ways to succeed without attending college? Um, so if there are other ways to, to uh, succeed, um, what is the most important reason to attend college, to pursue higher education? And the first answer, the number one answer is employability. Do you, do you all feel with the college landscape changing that employability is still a major reason for people to get through a higher education experience uh, steve do you, do you do you feel that that's that that's true yeah i mean i think we've always believed 
that, you know, the purpose of a qu- of post-secondary education is to help people with social and economic mobility, right? And so the process of going through college is about helping to support a future for you that is better. Like when Carla talks about those common goals, our common goals are always the same. We want our the following generation, our children, to be better off than we are, right? That's what we all want, right? We have different approaches that we all have thoughts, different thoughts on how we get there, but that's what we all want. And so if, if that is the goal, if that is the purpose of higher ed, we have to then look at whether or not one, it has been successful in doing that over time. And for the most part, a bachelor's degree has been associated with significant benefits to a person's life. You know, a million dollars more of salary in their lifetime, better health outcomes, better civic engagement outcomes, right? There's so many positives. It almost is a, a, a you know, it proofs you against recessions and unemployment, right? There's so many benefits. Yes, there are a variety of ways for someone to be successful. And college is not the only path towards that. That. But it is a path that has been proven time and time again for the past X number of years to be one that helps people achieve that social and economic mobility that they're looking for in their families. Um, as we, sh- I'm sorry, go ahead. No, I, I was just, I was just going to throw that that question over to Steve Stein. Steve, um, are you finding the same thing, and particularly in this? era in which education is not just happening in person, it's also happening through Zoom and these kinds of, of uh, mechanisms, online mechanisms. Are you also finding what, what Steve is talking about? So I think definitely, I do, I do think that there are more and more people looking at ways to create pathways outside of college to get good paying jobs. So I think that probably that's going to be more true now and in the future than it was before. But that I don't think changes the fact that probably the best pathway is still for going through college. And there are a lot more opportunities you're going to have with a college degree than you won't have with them. The other thing I'll let you Are you is, seeing the online and in-person experience being about similar, or is there one experience that is better, more advantageous? Steve, you're, you're shaking your head. Uh, Steve Colon, um, do you feel like it's in-person or, or online or both? Or what do you, what, what do you both think? Our experience has been for our students has been that, uh, you know, the virtual courses that they had were forced to take early in this in this uh, pandemic really did a disservice to those students. Many of those students did not perform well. They're still dealing with the sort of GPA outcomes of that and the learning loss from that. What I think is really critical and important here is whether that. Uh, learning happen online or whether our learning happen in in-person setting, what needs to be focused on at the higher ed level is pedagogy. How do we help students learn? What is the best approach, whether that modality is virtual or in person? How do we create a learning environment that best propels the most most students in that class to learn. And I think that is a place where higher ed continues to need to evolve and innovate on its approach to pedagogy to ensure whether a student is in a virtual setting or an in-person setting, that they're getting, they're learning in a way that they're best apt to learn and, and sort of pick up that material. What our experience has been, unfortunately, to date, is that many of those virtual environments have done a disservice to the students that we work with. Steve Stein, and then I'll, and then Carla, we're going to give you the last word since we're coming to the end. Steve? Yeah. The other thing I'll add is to the discussion about the, college, the impact of a college degree, I think we're also finding that for many professions, a college degree by itself is not enough. I don't necessarily mean you have to go to graduate school. What I mean is, you know, when we talk about economic mobility, which I think is unbelievably important, when we look at the corporate world and how not diverse it is, and we look at lawyers and, and STEM and, and, and doctors and consulting and finance and all these professions and how not diverse they are, graduating with a college degree by itself often isn't enough to enter those professions. The grades you have in college really do matter. The internships you have in college really do matter. Your ability to, to have the math you need to say in a STEM major really do matter. Um, so absolutely, college is really important. But we also have to be thinking about what do we need, what opportunities do these scholars need to make sure that they can actually graduate college with the grades they want and the degree they want for the job that they want. For some jobs, it doesn't matter, but for some jobs, especially in STEM, it very much does. Um, so I, I just want to kind of add that little layer. And Carla, can you give us the last word here in terms of, of where we should be heading? If you were going to uh, admonish uh, us all to do one thing to help improve uh, uh, the the prospects of young people to break into higher education. 
what was the what would what is the thing that we should do? Is it is it money? Is it support? Are there other changes that we should? It's make? a combination. There's not one. Yeah, there's not one solution. It's it's a comprehensive, you know, collaboration. All of us working together. It's not just on higher education. It's important for higher education to extend themselves and look for a resolution with the high schools, with community based organizations like ourselves. We all need to come together and collaborate because resources are limited. But if we work together and look for the answers in 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 that be afraid of change. I think a lot of large institutions always have that stigma that if it ain't broken, don't fix it. Really, it's broken people. Higher, higher education is not working as it is. It's, it's evolving like a scholar match. It evolved from a crowdfunding platform to, you know, comprehensive seven year program. It's proven to our pr program model, like bottom line and Thrive Scholars has proven success because we're meeting the needs of the students. We're student centered. That cannot be, we cannot forget that. We're here for students, for their success, they're our future. We need our economy to continue to be robust and we need their support and help. And that's what we, we need to come together and find solutions. We can't do it alone. What a great point to end on. And, and I would also um, uh, point the audience to uh, other programs. We've got uh, programs on advancing diversity in STEM fields. We have programs on the gender pay gra gap. Uh, we have so many different programs on different aspects of the education picture from all over this country. And this is just a fantastic, fantastic uh, addition. Thank you so much. Steve Colon, CEO of Bottom Line in Boston, Massachusetts. Carla Salazar, Executive Director of Scholar Match in San Francisco, California. And Steve Stein, CEO of Thrive Scholars. You are our heroes. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank your boards, thank your staffs, thank your constituents, thank your funders for, for your great work. On Thursday, we're going to be uh, talking about another aspect of, of education and uh, enjoyment, this cultural. We're gonna talk about the importance and relevance of symphony orchestras and orchestral music uh, to our culture. Uh, thank you all for coming. I'm in your debt. <laughs>